And we're going to continue our series on uh, Rebel to Revival. And, you know, as if you've been here the last several weeks, you know that we've been looking at Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, we've kind of looked at this uh, period in Israel's history where they um, have, you know, faced complete and utter destruction. And uh, this, is, this is a turning point for for Israel, for the nation of Israel and uh, their history. And everything that would essentially happen in these two books uh, would pave the way for uh, what we know as the New Testament. And uh, it, so it's like, it's a very like pivotal moment in history, uh, especially in the history of redemption and salvation. Um, so without everything that's going on in these books, um, we probably wouldn't be here today. Um, or anyway, that you can kind of get into a string theory type of scenario there where you can start imagining alternate universes and things. And so um, that's where my brain goes. But anyway, um, if you have your Bibles, open to Ezra chapter 8 and Nehemiah chapter 9. Um, We've been looking at Zerubbabel, uh, Nehemiah, and Ezra's good works, and we've been talking about them in the context of our good works. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says that uh, each and every one of us, we are God's masterpiece, and we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. And those good works he's planned for us long before we were ever in existence. And so uh, when we take an examination of our lives and who we are in Christ Jesus, uh, we can arrive at the conclusion that, that Jesus, that God in his divine plan for the whole universe includes each and every one of us. That we have, um, we have a role to play, a part to play, that there are things specifically that God has for us to do, which are the good works, um, and it's not just his you know, general plan for all of humanity and general purpose for all of humanity, uh, but it is a very specific thing that God wants us to do. They are a good work. So we are looking at Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, we're looking at uh, the way that we can uh, take the principles of uh, how they were rebuilding Israel and, and launching it on this new trajectory, how we can take those principles and apply them to our lives and um, uh, do what God has created each and every one of us to do um, to the best of our ability and also in partnership with God. Some of the things we've talked about, um, if you've missed a few weeks, uh, we've been talk we've talked extensively about purpose and assignment. Um, we've talked about God's enduring faithfulness. Um, you know, He is not only the giver of the assignment, but He is the keeper of the assignment. He is He is uh, the uh, the caller and the sustainer. Is who He is. Dylan last week talked about staying focused and staying and remaining faithful to the, the project at hand. And today, um, I'm going to talk about the role that intimacy plays, um, well, intimacy with God, what the, the role of intimacy with God plays in our, our good work, and how actually how, um, if I have time, how what we know and what we believe about God actually informs uh, our our prayer life. We get this from uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Actually, if you look at the two, two books, where something really interesting kind of unfolds is that you, you will kind of notice that they pray a lot. Like if you, you, I hope you've been reading along, you know, just over the last several weeks, reading Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and one of the things that you would notice is that, man, these guys are, they're praying an awful lot. They, like, they're every other page almost they're, they've got a prayer of some sort or um, they're you know it actually the narrative says that they stopped and they prayed or they stopped and they fasted and prayed or they sought the Lord and um, this becomes a recurring theme for them which is actually really um, it's interesting because it, if you take this sort of you know dynamic happening in these two books and place it upon um, Israel's history as a whole one of the things that you see is that this is actually kind of a reversal. This is, this is a, like a, a behavioral turnaround for the people of Israel. Because if you go back a thousand, yeah, about a thousand years to the Exodus, when 
Moses is up on Mount Sinai. He's, you know, up there getting the, the Ten Commandments chiseled into stone, and um, he's hanging out with God. And the people down below, the Israelites, they're getting all nervous and anxious that Moses has just completely disappeared for 40 days. It's like, wait a second, where is their, where's our leader, right? And so uh, they, they get Aaron, you know, and they, they kind of hold Aaron hostage, and they say, hey, dude, um, this Moses has disappeared. Uh, we need a God to worship. And so what do they do? They fashion a golden calf, right? And, and that actually begins, for Israel, that begins uh, a repeated behavior, a, a behavior that they would repeat for, for almost a thousand years. And, and so what they did in their, their anxiety is they turned to idolatry. They turned to, well, let's, uh, let's take on the ways of the world to solve our problems rather than seeking God, and, and here's the thing that you need to know is that God has always desired an intimate relationship with his people. He just desires it. He desires intimacy with us. This is one of the core teachings that, that Jesus uh, offers his disciples, right? So uh, the, the calf is kind of the beginning point. And here, in, in, in after the exile in Ezra and Nehemiah, you see them repeatedly like, you know what? We're not, gonna, we're not gonna do the idolatry thing anymore. We're not gonna look to the ways of the world to try and solve our kingdom problems, but we're gonna actually look to God. What a, what a noble thought, right? And so it's a reversal of this whole idolatrous behavior. It's really profound, and it's really kind of at the core of, of who God is for Israel, who God is for us. He's a, he is a father. He is our heavenly father who desires an intimate relationship with us. This is the, the key aspect of our discipleship. It's a key aspect of Jesus' teaching. Um, John 15, Jesus says, apart from me, you know, you can do nothing. Nothing. What, a, what an interesting statement. Apart from me, abide in me. And I will abide in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, because apart from me, you can do nothing. And he's teaching his disciples, look, this is, like, I've got to be the center of everything for you. Matthew chapter 7, 20, uh, 20 to 23, Jesus, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, makes a pretty specific point. He says, some of you um, will have prophesied and cast out demons and healed people and done miracles in my name, but... At the, final, at the final day, I'm going to say, I never knew you. And Jesus, in the, like at the end of his center, the Sermon on the Mount, he kind of brings it home and says, hey, this whole thing that I just talked about, it really, it really stems from us having a relationship with each other. This is, a, we'll talk, let's talk about Luke chapter 10. Um, Mary and Martha, right? We love the Mary and Martha story, right? You know, so, and I probably, if I would, Ask this question. Some of you identify, you know, as a Martha, and some of you would identify as a Mary. And we sort of sometimes think that that's what Jesus is talking about. And he's not talking about that. He's he's actually giving us a picture that 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 Mary is like she chose to sit at Jesus's feet, which is the place of the disciple. The whole story isn't about being a servant or being a, you know, somebody who sits around and does nothing and loafs and you know, just soaks in the presence of God. That's not the story. The story is that authentic discipleship actually is placing our, ourselves at the feet of Jesus. That's, the, that's what that whole thing's about. So in our discipleship, relational intimacy with God is key and for us to, to actually give our life to the good work that God created us to do is to partner with him in the good work. Really. It's the, he actually wants to be involved in the process. This was uh, the, if you are open to Ezra chapter 8, this is, the, this is kind of the context for Ezra's, you know, Ezra's got a dilemma. He... Um, I just got a text about starting line. Starting line's after church, by the way. 
This is the, the, the context of uh, Ezra chapter 8. Um, so he has been given uh, a great deal of gold, um, precious items that were carried off uh, when the, the Babylonians came in and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Uh, they wrecked the city and they, they ransacked the temple and they carried all the things off and they put it in a storeroom. And... Um, all of that stuff got returned to Ezra, and uh, he said, okay, go, go. And so uh, here's, the, here's the issue, is that Ezra um, is in probably someplace near what we would consider modern-day Baghdad, right? So uh, he's in Baghdad, and he's sent to, back to Jerusalem. He goes, okay, the, the, the king goes, okay, you're going back to Jerusalem. You're going to reestablish the law of Moses, the teachings of Moses um, uh, within Israel, and basically restore temple worship. And so he's given all this money and all of this stuff. And uh, he says that the hand of the Lord is upon him. And he goes, oh, this is really cool. And, but he's, in, he's in, in Baghdad, right? And Jerusalem is 900 miles away. The book of Ezra... Uh, chapter 7 tells us that it took him nearly five months to get from departure point to destination. That's a long journey. He had 5,000 people with him. And he had all of this wealth. Um, and on top of it, the 5,000 people that he had were uh, Levites. Um, they, were, uh, they were pastors. They're not trained fighters. And he had to travel 900, 900 miles along uh, the Euphrates River uh, through the Fertile Crescent, uh, through you know, Mosul, um, Aleppo, uh, all the way down. So they couldn't just you know, cross the desert. They had to go all the way up and around 900 miles. That's a dangerous journey. And so he has this, this realization like, um, okay, we, uh, we, we, have, we might have an issue. We have all of this wealth, and there's some not so nice people on the road. And on one hand, everything he has in his wagons and his carts and on his donkeys was given to him by the king. But was not given to him by the king was the protection he needed. And this is the way that our, our good work actually sometimes really unfolds is that we have we have on one hand we we receive resources that you know kind of come from man right we we receive um you know a, a role responsibility we receive some funding maybe we receive all of these things but there is always at the heart of one of our of our good work where we we can meet via our own ability uh, 90, let's say 90% of what it takes to complete the task. But there's, there's 10% that only God can do. And that's, the, that's the, the issue that Ezra was having. Was He got 90% of what he needed, actually probably like 50% of what he needed from the king, but he still had to make the journey. And so um, he had the former, but he needed, he needed the latter divine enablement, the, the protection of God. And so this is, this is what it says in verse 21 of chapter 8. It says, therefore, by the Ahava Canal, I proclaim to fast. And just for context, in case anybody's wondering, where is that? Um, I, okay. Let me, does anybody wonder where that is? One person in the back. It's about 250 kilometers around Babylon. Okay, all right, good. All right. So this is what he did. I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. I was, at verse 22, I was ashamed. This is this. He was ashamed. Not only did he forget to ask the king, he actually was ashamed to ask the king for protection. 
I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road. Because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all those who forsake him. Uh, I got to wonder, was, was this Ezra's statement of faith or was this like his hubris speaking? You wonder that? I, I, sometimes I think, we say things in hubris, but it becomes a faith statement. And sometimes we say things out of faith and it sort of ends up being just our own hubris. Um, and verse 23 says, so we fasted and petitioned our God about this. And guess what he did? He answered our prayer. What the community prayed for was not actually recorded. Um, but as I stated earlier, there's lots of prayers in Ezra and Nehemiah that are recorded. And they, I, I call them um, theological lasagnas, you know. Like, they are, like, if you get into these prayers, one, like, you see, like, man, they're, like, the theology that they're expressing, what they know about God and who he is and his nature and his character, you know, it's just, it's layered, it's layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of, of richness, of goodness, of truth about who God is. And this, these, are the, these are the prayers that we, we find ourselves, or we find them praying. And we can only kind of suggest that what Israel, there by the Ahava Canal, prayed and fasted and sought the Lord for is in context with the rest of the prayers that we find in Ezra and Nehemiah. One of the things that you actually really begin to, to see is that their, their prayer life, even from Nehemiah chapter one, when he finds out about Jerusalem and he, like, he immediately prays, Every prayer that they, they, they have throughout the books, they really look like, you can tell that their, their information about God is way more profound than anywhere else in the Bible. And it's likely, it's because it's like there's a, this is the end of the, this is the end of the exile period. So between, uh, the exile and the New Testament, like, I mean, that's, like, we're in our Bible, we're, we're talking about a page, right? And this is the blank page. This is the great blank page of the Bible that I just always talk about. Um, there are so many things that happened in that era that uh, really kind of informed the New Testament. Uh, but they had, they, they essentially had a, you know, completed, you know, Old Testament Hebrew text. They had the, the Psalms, they had the prophets, they had uh, the Torah. They had, they had everything that we have in the Old Testament except for Ezra and Nehemiah because, you know, it's obvious, right? Those books in their context were being written. But so everything they, they had in Scripture, you know, it really like informs what they believed about God. And this is, this is kind of what happens in um, our own prayer life. You know, Think about this in the context of your own dad. All right, if God's our father, um, we can think about this in the, the context of our earthly dad. Now, it's really hard, I'll say this, it's really hard if your earthly, earthly dad is just no good. Sorry. Because oftentimes our earthly father uh, causes us pro to project that behavior onto to God our Father. And so many times we see God our Father just like we see God our earthly Father, right? So heavenly Father and earthly Father uh, begin to sort of mix. And the truth is, is that God our Father is definitely nothing like. He's way better than our earthly Father. father. Even if you had a good Father, God is our, our better heavenly Father, right? So if that's the case, it's gonna be hard for you, but, and I would definitely recommend some healing in that area, because our view of God can often be distorted, and definitely at times needs to be 
readjusted and the lies that we believe about God need to be replaced with truth. Anyway, I digress. Um, if you have, a, if you have a, a poor example of an earthly father, you probably likely have somebody in your life that you hold in high esteem, that you trust, that you uh, regard deeply, that you could actually sort of, uh, if you needed to, you could place a bet on what they're going to do in a given situation, and it was always going to be to do the right thing or to be generous or to be kind or to be faithful, right? So you have that person. So in my life growing up, one of the things that I always could count on was with my earthly dad, um, that if I, you know, came up to him at church and said, hey, dad, and this happened a little bit ago, um, well, a couple weeks ago with Matt and his son, and it reminded me of my dad. Um, his, you know, Matt Reed, who did an excellent job a few weeks ago filling in for me, um, his, his son came up to him and said, dad, I want to go, uh, I'm going to go get some gas and get an energy drink. And, um, just like clockwork, like any dad would do, uh, Matt, Matt did this, right? He, he opened his wallet and he said, here you go, son, right? This is, this is what, like, and I, I just, like, that's what, like, that's what dads, dads do, right? They provide for their children. Um, I remember as a kid growing up many times that um, I would be hanging out of church and I'd go, dad, I'm gonna, you know, walk over to Speedway. And um, he would, uh, he would, or dad, hey, I'm going to go hang out with some friends after church. Uh, we're going to have some lunch, and is that okay? And I'll be back later. And uh, he said, oh, yeah. And one of the things I always knew about my dad is he, he had these, like, this ability to somehow create the crispest, like the, the, crisp, the crispiest, crispiest $20 bill that could ever be produced. It's like he, he ironed it and starched it, you know what I'm saying? Like you ever get a $20 bill that's just like so fresh, it's like, wow, this thing's like plastic. Um, I, I just, I always knew, like with, without, like, without a fail, without fail, without beyond a shadow of doubt, that as I say, Dad, I'm going to go to my friends and we're going to, you know, play video games and go to the mall. Um, and he would just... He would open his wallet. He would go, yeah, okay. Here, I've been saving this for you. And he'd hand me a $20 bill. And I'm like, well, do you want to give that to Adam or Aaron or, you know, Andrew? And, and uh, he goes, no, I want to give it to you. I'm like, great. And I, I just, I, I knew, you know, growing up, and I, I still know this today, that, like, if, if we're somewhere, if, if I'm with my dad and, you know, like, there's a bill to be paid. I just can kind of go, Dad? <laughs> I mean, like, we'll be out shopping for something, and he, he just, you know, and I'll, I'll be ready to, to pay, and, and he'll go, oh, no, no, let me, let me get this. So I, I just, I know that that behavior is in my dad. And when you're, when you're really little, these are the things that you're learning, but as you mature in life and as you grow and as you have a, develop a deeper relationship uh, with these, these people in your life, you just begin to expect, like, wow, they are, uh, they're kind, they're generous, they're always giving. And that's the, that's the, the nature of our relationship with God, the, the relationship that he desires to have with us is that the more, we, the more we learn about his nature and the more we learn about his character, the more we learn about our heavenly father, the more we, that stuff informs how we approach him, doesn't it? It, it actually, it, it changes what we expect from him. Because, like, when we, we know that, look, the arc of history, God wins at the end, right? We know that about God. We know that, look, everything that's going on in this world, all of, all of the, the chaos and all of the strife and all of, all of the dysfunction and the discord and the, uh, all of the stuff, if we just, we believe and we know and we, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God is working on all of that, then you know what we don't have to do? 
we don't have to worry about it. We don't. And that's what Paul says in Philippians chapter four, verse six and seven. And I, I know some of, some of you are like, oh, you love that verse. I hate that. Some of, some of you are like, I hate that verse. Because you... You look at me and go, oh, you like, you've got to be one of the calmest people I've ever met in my life. And you have absolutely no anxiety and no worry, and it's easy for you to say. You know, you pastors, it's easy for you to tell us not to, not to be anxious. Paul, it's easy for you to tell the Philippian church not to be anxious that he's in prison. That's just, you know, those are easy words to to put on paper. That's hard to live by though, right? But understand, what did, like, get this. What did Paul know about God? What did he know? He, he knew everything that happened in the Old Testament. He, he looked at his situation and he was in Philippians, he was in jail. He was sitting in a jail cell. And He's telling the Philippian church, look, in, in, in light of all of this stuff, you guys need to, have, you need to have some joy. Because you know what? It's gonna be okay. Christ is working all of these things out. The gospel is being preached. I'm having a, an opportunity to, to use my situation for, for the advancement of the kingdom. So, so be joyful in that, is what he's telling the church in Philippi. Um, and the reason he can say that is because he can look back as we can. We can look back and we can look from the beginning of this book to, you know, let's just say go to the time of Paul, right? So that is up until, you know, the beginning of the New Testament. And we have, we have all of this which informs our life and how we approach God and what we believe about him and what we know he is going to do. This was, so back to Ezra and Nehemiah, this is what, this is what they had. This is, this is the book that they had. So when Ezra's like calling a fast and a prayer, like, hey guys, we're in trouble. We've got 900 miles to go. There's bandits out on the road. We're going through, through a very turbulent area throughout all of history. That is, that part of the world is just, it's like, it's, it's just, it's a melting pot for combustible materials. Many of you have been there, you understand the complexity. But what, what they have is they have historical evidence of what God has done, of who he is, a written account of his nature, of his character. And every bit of that, every bit of that informs their prayer. And so when, when we have our good work to do and we're like, oh man, or we're living our life and we're, we're starting, you know, man, I've got, this, I've got this huge problem. I can't solve this thing. I need God to come through for me for this. And we start approaching God with that thing, then what, what begins to happen is what we know about God and his nature and his being replaces our anxiety. It replaces our concern that this thing is not going to be covered. This is, this is how Paul can say, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in all things, right? In thanksgiving and prayer, submit your requests to God. I know that's easier said than done. But I I'm I'm convinced and it's let me just let me just be transparent. There's there's not a week that goes by that I'm not concerned about something big that I have absolutely no control of. 
But as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you can't add a single day to your life by worrying about what you can't control. God, who cares about even the the lilies of the field, does he not care more about you? That's Matthew chapter 6. What I, in my life, when I'm anxious about something, and I, I do like, I, I do get concerned about things. When I, when I am that, I, I have to consciously take that, that thought and, and weigh it against everything that I know about God. And the, here's the great thing. The more that I know about God, actually, the bolder my prayer life gets. Really, I, it just, here's something that happened to me last week. Funny story. You'll like this. Um, the last several months, we've had these big rainstorms right before our Saturday mobile food pantry distributions. And what it does is it knocks out the, um, the reefer unit. I probably shouldn't say that anymore. Yeah, it's the, 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 the cooler truck. It used, it's, they're called reefer trucks. But now that reefer is legal in Ohio, that might have a different context. Uh, the cooler truck, the cooling unit, the refrigerator unit, the rainstorm knocks these things out, knocks this thing out, and we have a hard time getting this start. Actually, it won't start and, um, until it dries out. And we're like, okay, what's going on? Um, and I, I was... I was so worried about it last week. I was like, okay, I'm going like, to make sure this thing works for Saturday because we have an outreach Saturday and I, like, we need this thing to work. And so um, on Tuesday, I, I go and I run it for three or four hours. And it works perfectly. And I, okay, great. It's working. No problem. Uh, Wednesday comes along. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get in this truck and I'm going to start it up. And I, so I do that and it just works perfectly. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Okay, we're going we're gonna to work. Thursday comes along. And I'm like, well, I should probably check it one more time. And so I, I check it one more time and I, you know, power it up. And I'm like, oh, it, it works perfectly. Great. Uh, Friday comes along and I get here. We're getting ready to go do our, our pickup from the food bank because we pick up all this produce and eggs and meat and stuff. And that's when we really need the truck to work, the cooler truck. And um, I'm like, okay, all right, because we need to store 5,000 pounds of, you know, food overnight and keep it below 40 degrees. And uh, so I really need the truck to work. Otherwise, we're going to be in trouble. We've got a lot of rotten food. Um, and so Friday morning comes, and then 10 o'clock, I climb in the truck, and I'm like, it's worked all this week, right? Hit the button to turn it on, and guess what happened? Nothing. Click, 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 click. It makes this clicking noise. And I'm like, okay. This is starting to feel demonic. <laughs> I'm like, this is, that, like it worked all of this this week and now it's not working. And so I, like I just, I turned the thing off and I began to pray and I said, Lord, I just really need this truck to work. And I, um, by the authority of Jesus, if there's any demons up there in this unit, I command them to go. Please, Lord, bless us with a unit that is working 100% of the time. And amen. I was a little more forceful in the demon part, but um, hit the button, fires right up. Yeah, amen, yeah. Great. Worked perfectly yesterday. The the thing is, like, what, what we know about God and what do we know about his nature and his character, his power over all creation begins to inform how we pray. Right? It does. Faith, some people don't like faith because they think it's like a, a blind sort of like, you know, false hope type of situation. And, and faith, I, I can't, I can't say enough to actually dispel that, that idea because faith is not uh, a set of you know, false hopes or blind beliefs. Faith is something that we do based on evidence. 
isn't it? Right? I mean, it's like, take, take the chair that you're sitting in, for example. You, you believe in that chair based upon what it looks like, by the condition, uh, the fact that you've, you've sat in it before. There's so many different things that come into play when you actually, you know, make a decision to sit down somewhere, right? That is, that is faith. You are, you are making the decision to do something based upon the evidence that you can see. And our relationship with God is no different. We pray the, the prayers that we pray based upon the evidence that we can see in Scripture and in our own lives. We approach God in the way that we, we do for the things that we do, for the replacement of our anxieties based upon what we know about God. And this is, this is exactly how Paul can say, be anxious for nothing. Because he knows, he knows his heavenly father. He knows him. He's seen him. And this is back to Nehemiah. This is, this is what they do. They, and I'll, yeah, I'll just finish this. Can't leave this undone at this point. Uh, in Nehemiah, so we don't know what Ezra prayed, but we know what Ezra prays in Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter nine, if you turn over there, he systematically goes through God's nature and character and being and actions. He starts uh, his prayer with, in 9, 6, you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens and all the starry hosts, the earth and all it that, is in, that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything and the multitudes of heaven, they worship you, right? So he starts with creation, in his prayer, he's like, again, he's going to systematically go through this. He starts with creation. He starts with the biggest picture of all. He goes, okay, God, I can see that you are in everything. You are, didn't just create everything, but you, you sustain everything. You cause the, the, the wheat to grow and you cause the rain to fall. You've created creation in a way that it is self-propagating. This is your doing. The Psalms declare this too. Then in verse seven, he says, you are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful and you made a covenant with him. So he's, so now he goes from creation. He's, this is what he does. He starts from Genesis. Genesis one, he's going to creation and then he gets to Abraham. And God made a covenant with Abraham. And in the covenant between God and his people, it's a testimony to God's faithfulness. Every book along the way up until Ezra and Nehemiah era speaks of God's faithfulness to his people. Hosea, man, I just love this passage. Hosea says um, that, uh, it's uh, Hosea chapter eight, says that, that God is um, his compassion, his compassion is aroused to a nation that will not repent. He is more committed to Israel than Israel ever was to them. He is, he is so kind and he is so faithful to his people because he cannot deny his word. He made a covenant. And so throughout the, the Bible, the, the story speaks of this covenant. The next thing that he talks about is you, you're suffering you saw the suffering, God, of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their, their cry at the Red Sea. You sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his officials and all the people of his land. You knew how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. And you made a name for yourself, which remains to this day. You divided the sea before them, and so that they passed through it on dry ground, but you hurled the pursuers into the depths. He's telling the story of Israel's of deliverance. He's telling the Exodus story. And this, this here for, for Nehemiah or for Ezra, it's a, it's a testimony of God's faithfulness through his actions. If anything that we have in the Bible, we have testimony after testimony after testimony of God's actions. All the way through the New Testament. 
God was faithful, in, this is Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Jesus that we know on the pages of the gospel is the same Jesus that lives inside of us through the Holy Spirit. What Jesus did for those in the, in, in the, in the, on the pages of the gospel, he will do for us. He is faithful. We have stories. We have, we have God's actions. God's core identity also declares his faithfulness. In 927, so up until this point, he, the, the previous four or five verses, he actually gives a confession of their sin and a repentance. And then he talks about God's mercy and compassion, unwavering love. In verse 27, he writes, uh, but when they were oppressed, they cried out to you. From heaven, you heard them. And in your great compassion, you gave them deliverers who rescued them from their hand of their enemies. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven in your compassion, and you delivered them time after time. But in your great mercy, verse 31, but in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them. For you are gracious and merciful, God. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully, while we, as a people, have acted wickedly. What's he doing through these four verses? He repeatedly talks about God's mercy, compassion, his faithfulness, his compassion. He is making an appeal here. He is making a comparison of what God has done, and he's... If you go to Exodus chapter 33, all right, 33, yeah, Exodus 34. Sorry, here, it's on the screen behind me, isn't it? You have that passage? Look at this. Moses, up on Mount Sinai, says, God, show me your face. Show me, show me who you are. And this is what the Lord says to Moses says the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining his love to thousands and forgiving, uh, I'm sorry, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents. But Moses, you know, this is where you have to, you have to add in verse eight because people don't like to add in verse eight because they like the, they like to say, well, God, God's punishment. He's judgment. He's, you know, those who are in sin and wickedness, they're, he's, he's judging. But when you add in verse 8, it actually changes the, the dialogue. Because Moses, in verse 8, he asks God for mercy. Moses bowed down to the ground at once and worshiped. Lord, he said, if I found favor in your eyes, then let, let's go with, the, then go with us. Although, although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. So Moses asks to see God's face and God says, I'm the compassionate one. I'm the merciful one. I'm the one who forgives sin. I'm, I'm the one that's slow to anger. That's abounding in love. And so what is, what is God doing? Moses asks to see his face and God begins to say, well, my eyes are blue. I have big ears. My head is kind of big. Do you see this? God is, God is in word form painting a portrait of his, of his face to Moses. And fast forward to Nehemiah. Nehemiah and Nehemiah, Ezra is praying to God's face. You are compassionate. This is what we know about your character. This is what we know about your identity. This is what we know about what you look like to your people. When we stand before you face to face, this is who you are to us. And he's making his He's making his declaration based on that. Amen? All right, got through that. Let's stand.
I want you to think about something this week and I want you to begin praying for this. This is the question I want you to think about. In your good work, in your life right now, what is, what is the one thing that you need God's grace, that you need his enablement, that you need his provision? What aspect of the good work that, that Jesus has given you, what do you need him to come through for you for? Just like Ezra's protection of the resources on their 900 mile journey, what is it that you need God to do for you? To see the task to completion. That's your prayer point. That's what you begin, if you're like, well, I don't know what to begin praying for, that's what you begin praying for. What's the one thing that you need God to do that you can't do? We lift those up today, Lord, from our hearts. We ask God that you would come through for each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, for your enduring faithfulness. We come boldly, as Hebrews says, we come boldly before you. We come boldly before the throne of grace because we know you're good. We know you're faithful. And even when we, Lord, we think it's gonna work out another way and it doesn't work out that way, we can still trust that you're in it, that your hand is upon it. That you are, are working all things, Lord, as Romans says, to our good. even when it may not seem that way. Even when we think, man, we failed or we've blown it or there's no chance it could ever happen, we, we thank you, Lord, that your hand is over the arc of history and that we can, we can replace anything that we're anxious with just by that truth alone, that you, you have it covered. Your grace has it covered. Your power has it covered. Your sovereignty has it covered. And we trust you. You are the good father. And there is no good thing, as Jesus said, that you withhold from us. If we were to ask you for bread, we wouldn't, you wouldn't give us a stone. And we thank you for that. And would you give us the Holy Spirit just as Jesus promised that you would? We thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.